Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. So today we're gonna to be talking about something slightly different, something that's very timely. So as you guys know, uh, the COVID vaccine is sort of very big in the news right now. And we wanted to give you guys our experience with it um, as two doctors. Uh, so we'll get right into it. All right, so actually, um, Patrick was actually able to get the COVID vaccine now two days ago. So I wanted to ask him and let you guys know what his experience was with it. I know it's something that people are nervous about getting. Um, you know, it's a really, you know, it's a new drug and people are skeptical about kind of being the first uh, in line to get the vaccine. So uh, I'll let him share his experience with it, getting it now two days ago. How have you been doing? I'm good, you know, I got, um... Besides my soreness in my shoulder, you know, I've been getting some tingling in my head, some tingling in my chest when I'm in some dangerous situations. I think my friends say that I think it may be uh, spidey senses. I don't know. But anyways, for the last... So, <laughs> besides the corny dad jokes, <laughs> can you like seriously tell them how you're doing? <laughs> no, I'm feeling fine. I'm just the same as what I was. I'm feeling the same way that I felt prior to the vaccine other than the sore shoulder, which my wife keeps uh, bumping. For well, because I forget. Oh, just like that. <laughs> okay, see? No, so like, yeah, you know, because a lot of people are worried about potential side effects and, you know, they've given a list of potential side effects, but you... Have been really good. You haven't had I haven't any had fevers or chills or anything like that. So. I have nothing. I mean, really, the side effects really are well. The main ones that we got to watch out for um, um, being are for people who have allergic uh, reactions, uh, who are allergic to any component of the vaccine. And for those people, it may be lethal if you don't have Epi Pen around, or if you're not in a um, an environment where you can be monitored after receiving the vaccine. Um, even where I was after we got the vaccine, we had to stay um, in proximity of. Uh, we had to actually be in the hospital for 15 minutes before leaving. So. Oh yeah, I didn't know um, that. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So I haven't gotten the vaccine yet, and um, that's kind of a nice segue into uh, the controversy that's been sort of going on at our particular institution. So I don't know if you guys have been watching the news, but our institution we're both um, fellows. Um, at Stanford. So Patrick is a fellow in anesthesiology, specifically regional anesthesia and acute pain medicine. Yeah, and I'm a breast imaging fellow. So there's been a lot of controversy in the news at our institution about um, the availability of the vaccine for our trainees. Um, and so we're both considered trainees, we're fellows, we're in our last year of training. And um, I'll let you sort of describe what the controversy was and our experience with it and, you know, kind of what we think about it. Well, I mean, so the executives at Stanford, they were actually trying to be equitable with how they distributed the vaccine because there's so many people who are on the front line. That includes residents, that includes nurses, that includes our janitors or environmental services, uh, it includes the people who even deliver food to the patients. Yeah, anyone who like has kind of continuous patient contact is at risk, right? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, what they had done was they created an algorithm to try to figure out who should get the first allotment of vaccines. However, it was discovered on Tuesday that there was a flaw with the algorithm and it didn't quite factor in like where the residents work. So, I mean, some of the things that they took into factor was the age of the people. Mm -hmm where they worked in the hospital, the rates of infection. In that particular department, I mean. Yeah, right exactly. And actually, believe it or not, like physicians actually have a lower risk relative to some of the other healthcare workers with regards to catching COVID. But the one thing they kind of forgot or didn't factor in with regards to the residents and fellows was the location. Because the residents and fellows, they keep moving different places, so they're not ever in one particular spot. Yeah. So, so, I mean, I know that Stanford, you know, they definitely are, they're an institution that sort of thinks things out very, in a very detailed way before they proceed. And apparently this algorithm was flawed and didn't really take into account, uh, didn't really factor in residents or house staff. Um, to be recipients of sort of the first doses of the vaccines. I don't know how are 5,000, 5, I think, uh, vaccines that were made available. Um, this past week, I think only seven residents were invited um, to get vaccinated. Um, and so, I don't know if you guys are watching CNN, but there have been protests, you know, all across Stanford because of this. A lot of the house staff were really 
upset. So House staff refers to um, any trainees, so residents and fellows, and there were a lot of protests um, in the hospital at the time of the first vaccinations when they were being distributed. And it wasn't um, just the residents, it was also they had yeah. nurses and they had other people, other frontline workers that were part, that participated in the protest. Um, yeah. But yeah, it definitely sort of brought up a lot of attention to the campus. Um, there were definitely lots of news um, outlets, media that were there. I mean, yeah. I've seen stuff on Facebook. You know, they were Reddit, upset, uh, right, you know, rightfully so, because residents um, and fellows workforce. are often, yeah, they're the first ones in the room seeing the patient. And so, you know, not to prioritize them in getting vaccinated was an issue. But, you know, I, you know, we feel luckily Stanford is an institution that really listens to Yeah, you. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I know it was a debacle to some degree, but I mean, the fact that... Even the, despite all of that, you got your vaccine yeah. on the first day that it was being offered. Yeah. So, I mean, as soon as, you know, people started protesting and everyone was discussing it, they, they were... Made, they they were made making, it available to making, first come, first serve, you know, um, I think as of 2 p.m., which... I mean, to me, it says a lot because I know some places when there are protests, the people in power will double down. But the yeah. fact that they were able to actually make it available, and I mean, I was in line with a lot of residents and fellows, and we all got our, our shots, you know, so our vaccines. So, yeah. I, to be honest, I was impressed because I had never seen anything like that. But it also shows like how important it is to have a voice, and you know, the saying goes, "A closed mouth doesn't get fed." Yeah. You know, so people said what they needed to say, and we were listened to. And honestly, as uh, as being a fellow at Stanford and seeing the resources and the programs that are available to the residents and fellows, like while it may be a stain to some people, like if I were a resident, I would come here in a heartbeat. You know, I wouldn't even change my mind about coming here. It's, I mean, I'm still impressed by the things that. Um, Stanford has to offer and we have supportive uh, program directors and ch uh, chairman and chairwoman a lot of support all yeah. the way around and people exactly. really love what they do enjoy what they do enjoy coming to work everyone has this helpful attitude so yeah. it's a great place to yeah. be I think we have to be mindful of that you know um, and as much as we strive for perfection no place is perfect no but um, honestly compared to a lot of the institutions that I've been to this is I mean still quite top-notch so yeah yeah so absolutely and then I was gonna say so I do also plan on getting the vaccination I've actually been invited to get the vaccination so I'll probably schedule it sometime this week and sort of the considerations that went into me deciding to get the vaccination you have to sort of think about um, kind of your risk level Right? Patrick is an anesthesiologist, so you know, you are exposed to patients quite intimately. As am I exposed to patients, probably not as intimately, yeah. but it's, you know, as healthcare workers that go into the hospital every day, I think it's important to do whatever you can to be protected. Even though this is a new vaccine, people are sometimes skeptical. a little skeptical. I think that I'm willing to take it and I will be taking it. So I'm not going to lie about it. I was very skeptical about taking this vaccine. I mean, there's a horrible history of how black people have been treated not just black people minorities have been treated in the u.s and when it comes to experimentations and health care all of those things yeah and I, and I know that black people in particular are very skeptical about getting vaccinated exactly so, so i mean for, for me i mean despite all that stuff you know despite all of the horror stories that we have seen i think it for me boiled down to what I've seen and what I expect and weighing the risks. So for me, like when I was in New Orleans and when I was intubating patients, when I was being called to the ER, the And ICU, sorry, if you don't know what intubating means, like you're basically in a patient's mouth. Yeah, we're putting their airway. Their airway. Exactly, so you're so, getting stuff spewed out yeah, into your face. Very high literally. risk for contracting COVID. Yeah, so like, I mean, I did a lot of that back in March, April, and my risk was high being exposed to all that stuff. And just having seen what COVID-19 does to people, even, I mean, obviously, preferentially um, affects elderly patients and patients who already have other comorbidities like high blood pressure or obesity or diabetes. Like if you have any health condition, you're already at high risk. But when I was in New Orleans, I saw people who were healthy, who were even younger than me that were in, um, in the ICU. So that kind of scared me. And there are um, changes that occur to your lungs, 
to your um, kidneys, to your heart. Like now they're even saying that there are changes that happen to your brain. So like there's so much that's unknown about this virus. And while the vaccine is new, um, it, there's at least been nine months of data that's been compiled regarding the, the virus or the vaccine. And usually if there's a side effect, it usually happens within the first two months of receiving the vaccine. And even more crazy, I guess, or what adds to it is the fact that this is an mRNA vaccine, uh, which is different from what we used in the past. So this is relatively new. Yeah, but, the, but the cool thing is, that you're not actually using the virus, you're just using a piece of its RNA, so it's like a transcript. Um, it's information that um, is sent to our cells, and our cells essentially make the protein um, that the that mRNA... Amounts of immune response, right? Yeah. To that, to that mRNA. So essentially we are creating an immune response to a protein that's not the virus, but it's a part of the virus, and so that protects us from the, the virus itself. I think it's pretty cool because again, you're not using a virus, you're not using a live virus, you're not using a, a virus, but you're using a part of a virus that's common to the rest of, you know, the various strands. And so that's new and unique and I know that uh, creates a lot of fear for people. And while we have nine months of known information, there's still some unknown things that we have with regards to the vaccine. But when I weigh my risks of being with patients, and when I weigh like, the consequences of being um, infected with COVID-19, I would rather take the, the vaccine. So yeah, it's a brand new virus or it's a brand new um, vaccine, but um, it's quite effective. It actually is 95, for, at least the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines, they're about 95% um, effective, which is actually really high or more effective than some of the other vaccines that we use, um, I guess during our childhood and um, teenage years. So, yeah. I mean, I think that's pretty amazing. But I know there's some people who are still who still have doubts. But for me, again, I'm in a situation where I'm involved with high risk patients. I live with my grandmother; she's pretty old. I don't want to get any of these people like sick, you know. And I don't want to get sick myself and have any of these long term consequences. I'm still young, you know. So that's that. That's that's why I decided to take it. You know, I'm not forcing. I'm not saying that you have to take it or you don't have to take it. I mean, you guys can look up, re talk to your doctors or do your research yourself and figure out if it's the right choice for you. But obviously, if we have more people who take the vaccine, we get to that herd immunity more quickly. And we need at least 75% of people to be either vaccinated or have had coronavirus to even get close to having that herd immunity. So I just don't want another year of COVID. I don't think we, any of us do. So. so what would you say to people who are sort of still skeptical about you know, getting the vaccine, um, what, like, what would your advice be? Think about your risks, you know, if you are obese, if you have any medical condition, if you are on the elderly side or just older, I mean, you already have a risk factor, so. Yeah, something to answer, for um, sure. And then also think about your environment, because it's not just you, it's like, who's around you and how are you getting exposed to it, you know? Yeah. So, like, I can say in the Bay Area, people are more compliant with wearing masks. Than when we were in New Orleans. Yeah, when I was in New yeah. Orleans, or even Indiana, or Chicago, like, yeah. I mean, it's different, you know? So, yeah. that's something to factor in, but, um, and then think about who you're living with, that's another thing. But obviously, it's a again, very personal decision, I could, it's a obviously. very personal decision, and yeah. I, I could understand people who want to take it, but are still going to wait a few more months to see if there really are any other side effects. That's, I mean, it's a personal choice totally again. Personal. Like and nobody's if, forcing you to do it. Yeah, and if you're not in healthcare and you're at home and you feel like overall your risk is low, then I mean, I think it, you know, makes sense to wait and see. All right. So as far as you know, like we said, it's a very personal decision for me. Um, I'm a breast imaging fellow a radiologist. As a breast imaging radiologist, I do have exposure to patients, but probably not as intimately as my husband who's an anesthesiologist. But, you know, in particular, you know, we see patients as, you know, sort of consults if we're discussing like a potential breast cancer diagnosis. And we also do a lot of biopsies. And with ultrasound biopsies in particular, we're in, base, in very close proximity to the patient's face. And so um, it makes sense to, you know, consider that, you know, vaccine might be might be very uh, useful in the setting. So I will plan to get one as well. All right. Well, anything else you want to add? Anything else you want to say? Wear your mask, social distance, wash your hands, think of others. Yes, as always. And stay safe, guys. Take care. Bye. Is it
being recorded, man? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I can't stop laughing. <laughs>